This program contains edited language and graphic imagery. Viewer discretion is advised. I'm Robert McNeil. Welcome back to America at a Crossroads. People just don't get it. What do you say to someone who hasn't been there? The reality of war, in the words of those who fight. It's a story you feel like you have to tell. What my crew saw was a very personal human experience. It should affect you, and it did affect us. I think there's a false notion that we all ought to heal. There's something to be said for remembering. Now we meet the soldiers who write their wartime experience. I may not be a very good soldier, but I may be a very good witness. Funding for America at a Crossroads was provided by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. The Boeing Company is proud to support this broadcast of Operation Homecoming and the National Endowment for the Arts Operation Homecoming Initiative, bringing distinguished writers together with U.S. troops and their families to help share their wartime experiences. As in other wars, troops in Iraq are writing about their battlefield experiences. But in the information age, their words are traveling farther and faster giving their personal thoughts a wider audience. For instance, blogs like this can potentially be seen by thousands. Concerned troops use this new technology to reveal to the world the disgrace of the Abu Ghraib prison abuse. The National Endowment for the Arts put out an historic call for writing from troops who had served since 9-11 and their families and offered writing workshops in the field. They received some 10,000 submissions from which selections were made for a book entitled Operation Homecoming. Tonight's film turns some of those writings into documentary form. Because of Federal Communications Commission rules and the threat of heavy fines, we've had to bleep out the naughty words, so your delicate ears will be spared the language everyone knows all soldiers use. Um, here, bullet. If a body is what you want, then here is bone and gristle and flesh. Here is the clavicle snapped wish, the aorta's opened valves, that leap thought makes at the synaptic gap. Here is the adrenaline rush you crave, that inexorable flight, that insane puncture into heat and blood. And I dare you to finish what you've started. Because here, bullet, here is where I complete the word you bring hissing through the air. Here is where I moan the barrel's cold esophagus, triggering my tongue's explosives for the rifling I have inside of me. Each twist of the round spun deeper, because here, bullet, here is where the world ends every time. I wrote this, and then I kept it in my pocket for most of the time that I was there. I may not be a very good soldier, but I may be a very good witness. Well, this is the only way you're going to learn anything about it. And you have to know something about it, of course. Why? Because, well, we're, these, this is us. This is the world. This is what we're doing. It's what's happening. What is it really? Well, you can only find out through what is being written. I really want American people, I want them to read my writing, and I want them to understand that we're just regular people out there. There's no reason why the little guy can't tell the story. There's no reason why the guy at the bottom of the food chain doesn't have as much to say as the guy at the top of the food chain. I think soldiers write to try to make sense of what's going on around them, and also to try to make the people at home understand what they're going through. I wrote every day when I was in Vietnam, literally every day. I'd write 500 words or so, a thousand sometimes and send it home to my wife, trying to sort things out. I remember driving through the streets of the city, usually late at night, and wondering in the darkness if from some ledge or from around a corner, if there was a rifle barrel pointed at me. That unseen but felt threat pervaded those missions, and to uh, bring home to me the sense that death was nearby. It pushed my writing because it made me want to write as fast as I could while I was there. 
because it sounds, I, I know it might sound melodramatic now, but I didn't know, you know, I mean, there were finance, finance clerks getting killed, cooks getting killed, infantry soldiers getting killed. It was pretty much anybody who was open to being killed, and it could be me next week. Rousseau wrote, to yield to force is an act of necessity, not of will. It is at best an act of prudence. What every soldier should know. If you hear gunfire on a Thursday afternoon, assume it is a wedding party. Always enter a home with your right foot. The left is for cemeteries and unclean places. Oguf terarmik is rarely useful. It means stop or I'll shoot. Sabal khair is more useful. It means good morning. Inshallah means Allah be willing. Listen well for when it is spoken. You will hear the RPG coming for you. Not so for the roadside bomb. There are bombs under the overpasses, in trash piles, in bricks, and in cars. There are shopping carts with clothes soaked in fugas, a sticky gel of homemade napalm. There are parachute bombs and artillery shells sewn into the carcasses of dead farm animals. The overpasses have graffiti in English, which read, I will kill you, American. There are men who earn $80 to attack you and $5,000 to kill. There are small children who will play with you, old men with their talk, women who offer chai. Men wear vests rigged with explosives to walk up, raise their arms, and say, Inshallah. And the people who wave and smile today, remember, they may dance over your body tomorrow. I felt like if there was anything I was doing there, maybe this is why, this is why I was there, to write these poems, offer it to them back to people back home. I think the fact that experiences are written down necessarily sanitizes them just because you're fitting experiences into words that, I mean, it, there's, no matter how good the writing is, I feel like there's a limit to how much it can convey. The words in a dictionary somehow come unstuck from the experience of writhing in the dirt, being shot at, being almost dead, almost dead. And even those two words, almost dead, are so abstract as to be almost meaningless. They aren't the equivalent of what's happening in your soul. Combat, for me, is very real. However, the images sometimes may really, out of context, may seem rather surreal. It's all kinds of running, paths crossing, bullets ricocheting and people trying to stay alive. Some people, when they write about combat, I guess, kind of have a romantic uh, image of it. That wasn't my experience. The whole time I wanted it to stop, you know. It was pretty intense and I thought it'd be all over the news. And um, there was hardly any mention of it. I was like, well, if no one's gonna write about it, I'll take a shot at it. I remember just sitting there thinking, okay, just start from the beginning. I was sitting in my room, sort of went from there, just started typing and typing. I was in my room reading a book, Thin Red Line, when the mortars started coming down. Sergeant Horrocks ripped open the door and yelled, grab your guys and go to the motor pool. The whole battalion is rolling out. Holy shit, the whole battalion. This must be big. One by one, the strikers were rolling out of the motor pool, ready to hunt down whoever was with us. Soldiers in the hatches of the vehicles were hooting and hollering, yelling their war cries, doing the Indian yell thing as they locked and loaded their weapons. As we headed north up Route Tampa, I was sticking out of my hatch behind the 50 cal, and I glanced over to the left side of the vehicle, at which time I observed a man dressed in all black with a terrorist beard jump out all of a sudden from the side of the building. He pointed his AK-47 barrel right at my pupils. I froze. And then a split second later, I saw the fire from his muzzle flash leaving the end of his barrel, brass shell casings exiting the side of his AK as he was shooting directly at me. 
I heard and felt the bullets whiz literally inches from my head, hitting all around my hatch and making a ping, ping, ping sound. All of a sudden, all hell came down around us. All these guys were in all black, a couple dozen on each side of the street, on rooftops, alleys, edge of buildings, out of windows, everywhere, started unloading on us. AK fire and multiple RPGs were flying at us from every single f direction. IEDs were being ignited on both sides of the street. I kind of lost it and was yelling and screaming all sorts of things, mostly cuss words. I fired and fired and fired and fired and fired at everything. I saw a crowd of people suspiciously peeking around a corner at us. I pointed this out to Sergeant Horner. As he was shooting nonstop from his hatch, he told me to just shoot him, and he briefly explained to me these people have no business out on the street whatsoever. So I pointed the crosshairs right at him. Then I moved it to right above their heads and fired a burst. Just got them to disperse in a hurry. I could tell that they were just spectators. I was frantically scanning my sector when suddenly, about 300 meters away from us, I saw two guys with those red and white jihad towels wrapped around their heads, creeping around the corner. They were hunched down, hiding behind a stack of truck tires. I placed the crosshairs right on them and was about to waste them. For some reason, I didn't pull the trigger. Something told me I should wait for just one, maybe two more seconds. Then I saw another guy come creeping around that corner with an RPG in his hands. As soon as I saw that, I screamed as loud as I could, RPG! My crosshairs were bouncing all over, so I gathered my composure as fast as I could, put the crosshairs on him, and engaged him with a couple good 10-round bursts of some 50 cal right at him. Nobody moved from behind those tires after that. We had to return to Fab Merez as we were running extremely low on fuel, ammo, and water, so we all mounted up and drove back to the Fab. I was smoking like a chimney. My nerves were completely shot. I was emotionally drained, and I noticed that my hands were still kind of shaken. The stars were now out over Mosul, and I decided to go sit by myself and stare at him for a while. I was thinking how I was lucky to be alive. I've never experienced anything like the fear I felt today. I thought about that guy with that angry look on his face when he pointed the AK at my head and pulled the trigger. Sergeant Vance saw me sitting by myself and he came over and sat next to me. He asked if I was okay. I thought about that one for a second. I told him, I don't know. I told him how I wasn't really in the mood to roll back out for another inning with these guys and I also told him that I was kind of tripping out about how not everybody that I engaged today had a weapon in their hands that I wasn't really too sure about what happened to some of those people. Vance started telling me a little bit about his father, who'd been in Vietnam, and who had given him sound advice about situations like this. Put all the things that bother you and keep you awake at night and clog your head up. Put all those things in a shoebox. Put the lid on it and deal with it later. I walked back to my room, thanked God, passed out on my bed. I've put the events of that day in a shoebox, put the lid on it. I haven't opened it since. People just don't get it. I mean, what do you say to someone who, who hasn't been there and they want you to, to tell you, you know, hey, you know, what was it like? Uh, you know, where do I even start? I feel for them, even though we're quite different since none of them was drafted and they all did volunteer. But once you get there, I guess that, uh, that difference uh, evaporates. It's about killing the enemy. You know, get them hard, get them first, and then go home. That's what it's about. For me and for a lot of people I knew, you didn't wake up in the morning and go, I'm going to go bring freedom. That wasn't your life. Your life was, I'm gonna have to get in that Humvee or that tank and roll out there and not die. You're afraid a lot when you're in this situation. And fear does not bring out the best in us. It brings out a lot of ugliness. And you really hate the people who make you feel afraid because you're ashamed of being afraid. There's a lot of haji this and haji that. Anything that's Arabic in Iraq, you know, it's, it's haji. You start to think that you and the guys around you are competent and alert, and you're going to take care of what situation arises. And you get kind of aggressive. I mean, you, somebody makes a, a wrong move, and they have a machine gun swung on them. War is a passage, whether you live or whether you die. 
If you undergo a change that significant, it's a story you feel like you have to tell in a way. I never heard the boom crunch, only imagined it later. Our striker moaned through its monstrous air brakes and then bumped, heaved, and finally ground itself to a halt. Six sevens in the ditch. They roll it. No, they're out. The colonel's vehicle okay. The major said that we would need a combat lifesaver. Well, it wasn't combat. There were no lives left to save. But we dug out the CLS bag, because you never know, do you? And walked across a pitch dark highway. Somebody was wailing in Arabic, hypnotically, repetitiously. A single car headlight was burning, a single shaft of light beaming across the road like an accusing finger. When tactical spotlights suddenly illuminated the little car, we found the source of the wailing. He was an older man, wearing a silver beard, a monumental red-veined nose, and a big, thick wool overcoat. He was hopping like a dervish, bowing rapidly from the waist and throwing his arms to the sky, then to his knees, over and over again, in a kind of elaborate dance of grief. It's hard to describe the contents of the car. They had been a man only moments earlier that night. A cop or a fireman or a soldier would have simply said, it's a mess in there. I used to be a fireman. I'm a soldier now. It was as bad a mess as I've seen. I thought about CPR, but only for a moment. His left arm was mostly torn off and the left side of his head was flattened. Up on the highway, GIs walked around, gave and took orders. And by the car, the victim's father still capered madly, throwing his arms around, crying out to God or anyone. I asked him, in my own language, to come with me to calm down, to let me help him. While the medic worked on him, the colonel's interpreter came over and fired a few questions at the man. It sounded like an interrogation. A younger man had been taking his father back from shopping. They were minutes from home. The young man had been a student, engineering, with honors, the pride of the family. What we like to think of as Iraq's future. Finally, I had to ask, what does he keep saying? The turp looked at me disgusted, resigned, or maybe just plain tired. He says to kill him now. I walked away in Little Galois. A sergeant came up next to me, smoking. I didn't say anything. After a few moments in the black quiet, I overheard him say, it wasn't anyone's fault. It was just an accident. I know. Inhale. Cherry glow. Long exhale. Why we gotta drive in black out here, I don't get. Yeah, I know. I went and sat on the back gate of the striker. I felt the cold creep into me. The old man sat next to me, perhaps too tired to continue his tirade against cruel fate, careless Americans, war and its accidents. I haven't lost a full-grown son, just a little daughter, a baby, and she wasn't torn from me in a terror of rending steel, stamped out by a sudden monster. She went so quietly that her passing never woke her mother. I like to think she kissed her on the way out, on her way home. But still, sitting on the steel tail of that monster that killed his son, I think maybe I knew just how one Iraqi man felt. Just kill me now. We sat and looked straight into the lights. I never thought of that guy as Haji. He was a man who lost his son, and I couldn't avoid, I, I didn't even think of the comparisons when I was first writing it, but I, I just knew that I had to, had to write something about that. He's not 
different for me. Before going to Iraq, I'd always seen movies and I'd seen these greater narratives. You know, there's a group of guys got to go blow up a bridge and that helps save the battle or something. I didn't find any of that. What I found was just pure boredom for a year, you know, but punctuated by these extreme, intense events. It would get so boring that you would look forward to a scorpion fight. Everyone has their little scorpions in little coffee cans and jugs and stuff. And, you know, when you run up against another team out there on the perimeter or someplace, you just like, okay, who you got? Where I was, we didn't have electricity. So we would throw rocks is what we did probably 98% of the time. Make up our own rock throwing games, throw it on top of the tent, make it roll off, throw it on top of the tent, make it stay. We played cards and we rewrote songs and we wrestled. Humor is the opposite side of war. War is desperately sincere. When you are scared, you are scared and the enemy is scared and so forth. and. You're doing the same thing to each other, and none of it is funny. The reason I was writing was mostly to just keep my wife informed and my family, who were very worried about me. And the best way to tell them I was doing fine was just to make jokes about what I was doing. I had been in country two days. I had had the wits scared out of me. I was lost, tired, alone, hungry. But I was looking around me and going, this place is unbelievable. I sat down and just started describing kind of a primer to desert life. Hello all, greetings from the biggest and greatest show on earth. I know a number of you have been curious about what it's like over here, so we're gonna take a small mental voyage. First off, we're going to prepare our living area. Go to your vacuum. Open the canister and pour it all over you. Your bed, clothing, and your personal effects. Now, roll in it until it's in your eyes, nose, ears, hair, and, well, you get the picture. You know it's just perfect when you slap your chest and cough from the dust cloud you kicked up. And no, there is no escape, trust me. You just get used to it. I've been at the beach for a week now and I can't find the ocean. Just the sand. <laughs> now grab a flashlight and attach it to your clothing, as we must, because every 20 to 30 minutes, the power goes off for a while. There will be no apparent reason for this loss, except it will always happen during, but not limited to, three key times. One, shift change. Two, a meal. Three, any time you can't get to your flashlight. <laughs> Okay, pitch a tent in your driveway and mark off an area inside it along one wall about six feet by eight feet, including your bed. Pack everything you need to live for four months without Walmart and move in. Tear down the three walls of your tent seen from the street and you have about as much privacy as I have. Well, that's the first hole he had his finger in the wall. <laughs> if you really want to make this accurate, bring in a kennel full of pugs. The smell, loud grunting, and snoring will be just like living with my nine tent mates. The breakfast chow was great the first day. Okay, the second, third, and fourth, with decreasing levels of enthusiasm. Until I realized it's the same thing every day for breakfast. We'll see how long I go before I start blending it into a pile and using a straw for some variety. Somebody told you you don't like it, don't eat it. Remember that? <laughs> After breakfast, we make our way to the deuce. Yes, folks, a real honest-to-God picture in the dictionary under army truck, deuce and a half. All our vehicles were used in the first Gulf War. They thrashed all the way across Kuwait and Iraq, then were driven back to Kuwait and stored in a field. Twelve years later, they were dusted off, fueled up, and used to assault all the way into Iraq again. The sight of the 12 of us in our battle rattle, red-faced and watery-eyed from the biting wind and stinking exhaust, howling happily over the noise, makes me want to crank up Wagner's Flight of the Valkyries. We look like born-again, hard-ass, gung-ho mofos. Yet, we are just jet mechanics and assorted office workers. We fully realize that this is probably the closest we will ever get to being in the military we all thought we would be joining. 
do it in Iraq is just something that I know I'll never forget. This is what our rack is like. Yeah. Are we comfy now? <laughs> I am. <laughs> Love, Parker. We joke about what scares us, and we're laughing at it. We're not scared about it as much. We're sharing it. We're all chuckling nervously instead of dying that inner death. I find combat, the actual process of pulling the trigger and exploding things and killing people, to be very far removed from any agenda whatsoever. W once you've entered that interaction, it's black and white. It's kill or be killed, right? And so that has nothing to do with anything that you believe. Practically, the moment you're born, you're told it's wrong to kill people, and then you're put into a situation where that's what you're told to do, and it's, it's not something you can turn off so quickly. This is the story that I heard over and over again from so many different people. The exact details are, they're not going to be completely accurate, which is why I call it fiction, but the broad strokes, those are based on actual events. Kasim was only a few paces from the road when he caught his first glimpse of the approaching vehicles. His heart jumped into his throat as he dropped the clump of soil he'd been examining. He knew something was about to happen. The town on the far side of the road was suddenly empty. The three trucks drew steadily closer and were soon just 100 meters away. From this distance, Kasim could make out the faces of the individual soldiers. It was the closest he'd ever come to them, he realized. And he was still studying their expressions when the explosion engulfed the last truck in the convoy. The noise was deafening, and the old farmer felt the ground shake beneath his feet. But Kasim stood fixed in place, observing the aftermath. He wanted to see what the Americans would do. The answer was not long in coming. The Americans started shooting. He turned to run. Sergeant Price was kneeling just a few meters away from his Humvee, taking aim with his rifle. If they're running, they're guilty. The credo had been drilled in their heads over and over again, and it was what went through the sergeant's head as he knelt to take aim. He desperately wanted the man to stop running before he squeezed the trigger. The rifle kicked back against his shoulder where it was braced. Price could see a small puff of dirt rising a few meters ahead of the man. There was no way the Iraqi could have missed it, and yet he kept on running. Stop! Price shouted at the man's back. He gave the man another second, then skipped another round in front of him. It would be so simple for the man to stop, Price thought, as the silent anger rose up inside of him. Just stop running. His mind screamed at the man. The son of a bitch was gonna make him shoot. Price hated the man at that moment. He wanted the man to die for the sin of forcing Price to kill him. Stop! He shouted only a half second before he fired again. Kasim kept his jaw clenched tightly shut. He refused to look down at his abdomen for fear that the sight would fill him with horror and he would cry out or weep. He was less than 200 meters from his house. Inside, his wife would be huddled in the far corner. The smallest children gathered around her while the older ones hid elsewhere in the field. He saw the outlines of the Americans when he opened his eyes, though the world had taken on a terrible brightness. There was something about them that made them soft, almost pudgy. They were people used to luxury, and soon they would go back to their old lives while he would be dead and his children left fatherless. At last, he could feel anger cutting through the pain. Sergeant Price knew it was hopeless the moment he saw the ground under the man turning into dark, bloody mud. Still, 
the Iraqi was alive and conscious, and the only alternative to trying to save him was to return to their Humvee and watch him die from the side of the road. About the only thing he could do was to give the man an IV to try to keep up his blood pressure. It was absurd, he thought to himself, that he was holding a little plastic bag over a man whose vital organs were sitting in a pile on top of him. But he simply didn't know what else to do. Kasim could feel the American helicopter taking off. How would his wife and sons ever be able to bury him now? He didn't even know where they were carrying him. He silently cursed his own stupidity. He also cursed the Americans for their guns and the young men who attacked them with their bombs. He almost cursed God, but just barely caught himself. He was going to die, and there was nothing he could do about it. He looked around the helicopter once more, trying to catch a few last glimpses of his surroundings. On the far wall was a window, the blue Iraqi sky beyond. Across from him, there was an American soldier clenching his eyes shut and shaking slightly. Kasim could see that for all the fabulous technology that his country had sent with him, the soldier was still filled with terror. He is a boy, Kasim said to himself. It will be over soon, Kasim thought as each breath grew more labored than the last. He took one final look at the soldier and closed his eyes. I know that there's a lot of stuff in the news and whatnot about things that soldiers are doing and I think part of what I wanted to do was try to humanize the decisions of the soldiers and try to convey just how hard it is to make those decisions. And sometimes, sometimes we'll get it wrong. And sometimes we'll get it right and not know it. I mean, there are people out there in real life who have to live not with the knowledge, but with the question, did I do what was right or did I make a terrible mistake? And I mean, the bottom line is, you don't know. So yeah, they're, they're in terrible conflict because their values are essentially humane, but the actions that they're called upon to perform aren't, and, and that is, is an irresolvable kind of conflict. You know, it puts you at war with others, but it also kind of permanently puts you at war with yourself, too. One thing that you're trained for in the military is perfection. War is not about perfection. It's about a bloody, ugly mess. And so in the midst of this world where you're supposed to constantly achieve perfection, you can't. And I think that breeds guilt and regret and second guessing you know, one's actions. To me, the war on TV seemed very antiseptic. We were always saying, this isn't right. This isn't the way it is. This is not the way we see the war. So I just started writing what we were experiencing. What my crew saw was a very up close, personal, human experience. Uh, that's all we did every day, is these battered human beings uh, would come onto our plane, and we had to take care of them. Our patient load is 11, 7, and 2, and a duty passenger. That means 11 litter patients, 7 walking wounded, and 2 attendants. Some can take care of themselves, some need lots of help. All have been waiting for us for a long time and need pain medicine and antibiotics. The patients include gunshot wound to the stomach, partial amputations from a landmine, open fractures secondary to gunshot wound, head injury struck by a tank, blast injuries, shrapnel injuries, and dislocations. The patients are mainly from the Marines and the 101st Airborne Screaming Eagles. Many were involved in ambushes. Three, 
I've noticed that the most seriously injured are the youngest. The older, experienced soldiers do a better job of staying alive and avoiding the flying metal. One soldier I'm treating looks like a young boy. We talk for a bit as I assess him. I medicate him for his pain. The morphine is not working, but it's the strongest stuff I've got. At some point during these adjustments, I accidentally dislodge a hemovac suction unit from one of his infected wounds. Foul-smelling, reddish-yellow fluid drains from the tube and drips off the litter. I start looking at his bandages to find the other end of the tubing. I open one bandage and find sand fleas where his toes used to be. I try my best to keep a straight face, but the sight nauseates me. We finally get this soldier comfortable. Because we moved him so much, I decide to reassess his extremities. I know there are parts of his leg and thigh missing from reading his medical record, but I can't tell from the thick bandages. The wounds were left open to allow them to a light layer of sand. I ask the soldier to wiggle the toes he has. On one side, his toes move fine. On the other side, there is no movement. What is left on that side is cold and hard to the touch. He looks at me, and our eyes are locked. His eyes say, tell me I'm going to be okay. Tell me that I'm going to be fine. Tell me I'm going to be whole again. These are some of the longest seconds of my life because I know he's counting on what I say to him. I bend down below the litter to break eye contact. I act like I'm adjusting some of the medical equipment attached to him. My mind is racing. I've always been honest with my patients. Do I lie or tell him the truth? The seconds move so slowly as I fight my internal battle on what is right. I stand straight up, and there are his eyes. I'm at the end of the litter, and with the noise of the plane, there's no way he can hear me speak. We are now communicating solely with our eyes and facial expressions. I'm sure less than two seconds pass before I give him a big smile and a thumbs up. Those two seconds felt like an hour. He broke into a big smile of relief, and I felt broken for lying to him. He motioned to me, and I walked to the head of the litter. I leaned in so he could yell into my ear over the jet noise. Why do my feet feel so cold? He asked. I yelled back. There's a lot of swelling in your feet, and the blood circulation is not so good because the swelling is way too early in the game to tell how well you're going to heal. The swelling is going to affect your senses and ability to move. These were all true statements. I felt reassured with my answer. It is too early to say how this soldier will recover. But I still felt bad about lying. What does the future hold for these men who go home to their families mentally and physically different? And what of the critically injured who have a long future of VA hospital followed by VA disability? How do they cope? How do they adjust? I feel obligated to stay out here and take care of the wounded. I want to do all I can to help them. War does not change through time as far as what it does to a human being. If you look back at what was written in World War I, World War II, back to the Romans, the writers who write about the human experience and what that does to a person mentally, physically, that doesn't change with time. It's the same. And that's what I want people to remember is war is not this glorious thing that's made in a movie on TV. When you break it down to the human level, uh, it's actually quite disgusting. go out, you do your mission, somebody shot at you, you shot back. But it wasn't a big deal anymore. You would allow yourself only to get excited enough to do what you needed to do, to patch somebody up, to fight if you needed to fight, but no more than that. And the rest of the time, just kind of, I guess I would say emotionally flat. Not very excited, not very happy, but then not crushed either. And that flatness 
has continued for me. I would be more concerned about myself if I came home and had no issues than, you know, I came home and I had a few, but that was fine. Because you shouldn't be able to spend a year out there and come home like you, nothing ever happened. It should affect you, and it did affect us. I think there's a false notion that we all ought to recover from everything. From divorce and broken homes and wars and get on and be do better. We all, ought to, we all ought to heal. And I don't believe in it. I believe the opposite, that there are some things you shouldn't heal from. They're unhealable. And if they are healable, you oughtn't do it anyway. There's something to be said for remembering and not healing. When you sign up as a soldier, you lay the course of your life in a large degree in the hands of, of your nation. And, and that's extremely laudable and admirable in a lot of ways. So I think people want to know what, what those men and women go through. I buried my friend, Scott Love, who was a sergeant with me back at Fort Hood. And that sense of very personal loss brings you a lot of questions about what, what you're participating in and why and what the value of that is. Here all, we are dying. Not in some philosophical or chronological, the end comes for all of us sooner or later sense. Just dying. Sure, it's an occupational hazard, and yeah, you can get killed walking down the street in any town USA, but not like this. Not car bombs that leave craters in the road. Not jeering crowds that celebrate your destruction. It's never been a fair fight, and we haven't always played nice, but not like this. No one leaves the gate looking to kill or looking to die. No one wakes up in the morning and says, I sure hope blowing up a whole group of Iraqis goes well today. That's for suckers and cowards. People are afraid to delve into the melee and fight it out, to sort it out like soldiers. They've killed my friends. And not in some heroic fight to defend sovereign territory, not in some suicide mission to extract a prisoner or save a family in distress, just driving downtown to a meeting just going to work. When you've held a conversation with a man, briefed him on his mission, his objective, and reminded him of the potential consequences during the actioning of it, only to hear he never returned and did not die gracefully, though blessedly quickly, prayerfully, painlessly, you do not breathe the same ever after. Breath is sweet. Sleep is sweeter. Friends are priceless. It is also now undeniable, irrevocable, that you will see your mission through. You will strive every day. You will live, though you are not ever again sure why. We must see it through to the end. They have seen every instant, every mission, every chore, every day through, not to its end, but to theirs. They died standing with their friends, doing their jobs, fulfilling some far-flung, nearly non-existent notion called duty. They died because their friends could have died just as easily, and knowing that, they would never shirk their duties, never call in sick, never give in to fear, never let down. Their lives are lost, whether as a gift laid down at the feet of their friends or a pointless discard of precious life. I doubt I'll ever know. I'm okay, Mom. I'm just a little shaken, a little sad. I know this isn't any divine mission. No God, Allah, Jesus, Buddha, or other divinity ever decreed, go get your body ripped to shreds. It's for the better. This is man's doing. This is man's war, and war it is. It is not fair, nor right, nor simple, nor is it over. I don't care about bloodlust, justice, or revenge, but we will not give up. We cannot. Our lives are forever tied to those lost, and we cannot leave them now as we might have were they still living. We have so little time to mourn, to breathe, to laugh, to remember, to forget. Every day awaits us impatient, impending, so now we rise, 
shunning tears, biting back trembling lips, stifling sobs of grief. And we walk, shoulder to shoulder, to the call of duty, in tribute to the fallen. And one of the losses was, was a man I, I sent on a mission, right, who, who I, I briefed and uh, I gave an assessment to and I provided resources to. Uh, and to know that, that that was it, that was the last thing he did was go out there, uh, it was stunning. Anytime the news would come on and they'd say one soldier was killed, just by the numbers we saw, uh, our crew knew, okay, if one soldier was killed, that means we've got 10 wounded today. We use the 10 to 1 rule. In the five months that my unit was over there, we evacuated 7,000 people. And when I tell people that back home, the majority of them don't believe me. It seems like uh, America has, for the most part, except for maybe 15 seconds at the 6 o'clock news, has forgotten that there's a war going on. That's the sign of a really decadent civilization, is one that sends young people out to do and to suffer the things that soldiers do and suffer in wars and not to care about what those things are and not to have any cost laid on them, uh, even of knowing what is going on. To avoid even that cost, we seem to have avoided every other, uh, but even to avoid that cost, that's a, de that's a decadence. It's an unforgivable decadence. All these people that come back from war they permeate through their entire society. They become friends, lovers, co-workers, husbands, wives, you know, mothers, fathers, and it's part of what it means to be an American now. We're so buffeted in our society by television and political news, and you get a nerd to it. It's just an abstract thing happening out in the world, and you may even have strong political opinions one way or the other, but to care about the men and women living it day by day, it's a hard leap to make. It's probably what art does, what its function is. It can put you in the shoes of that poor sucker, you know, pinned down in that poor little courtyard in the middle of nowhere and make you care about him. The military provides a, a uniformed escort with all of the remains to take them back to wherever their final resting place is. The Marine Corps put out a call for volunteers to be escorts. I volunteered for that. Um, I was by no means unique in that. That's how I came to be the one that took Chance Phelps back home. I thought it was just phenomenal, the way ordinary people who didn't know him at all, um, didn't know the circumstances of his death other than it was in Iraq, and obviously didn't know his family. Yet from, from Dover, Philadelphia, Minneapolis, Billings, all the way to Wyoming, people were deeply saddened and, and um, grateful. And, and I got that. It was it's just something I wanted to remember. When we arrived at Billings, I was the first off the plane. The funeral director had driven five hours up from Riverton, Wyoming to meet us. He shook my hand as if I had personally lost a brother. I picked up my rental car and followed Chance for the five hours back to Riverton. During the long trip, I imagined how my meeting with Chance's parents would go. I didn't know anything about Chance Phelps, not even what he looked like. I wondered about his family and what it would be like to meet them. I was very nervous about that. When we finally arrived at the funeral home, I felt I needed to inspect Chance's uniform to ensure everything was proper. Earlier in the day, I wasn't sure how I'd handle this moment. Suddenly, the casket was open, and I got my first look at Chance Phelps. His uniform was immaculate, a tribute to the professionalism of the Marines at Dover. I noticed that he wore six ribbons over his marksmanship badge. The senior one was his Purple Heart, 
I had been in the Corps for more than 17 years, including a combat tour, and was wearing eight ribbons. This private first class, with less than a year in the Corps, had already earned six. The next morning, I wore my dress blues and followed the hearse for the trip up to Du Bois, population about 900, some 90 miles away. This was the most difficult leg of our trip for me. I was bracing for the moment when I would meet his parents and hoping I would find the right words as I presented them with Chance's personal effects. We got to the high school about four hours before the service was to begin. In short order, I met Chance's stepmom and father, followed by his stepdad and at last, his mom. I told them about our trip. I told them how at every step Chance was treated with respect, dignity, and honor. I didn't know how to express to these people my sympathy for their loss and my gratitude for their sacrifice. Now, however, they were repeatedly thanking me for bringing their son home and for my service. I was humbled beyond words. The service was a fitting tribute to this hero. When it was over, we stood as the casket was wheeled out with the family following. The casket was placed onto a horse-drawn carriage for the mile-long trip from the gym down the main street, then up the steep hill to the cemetery. I stood alone and saluted as the carriage departed the high school. All along the route, people had lined the street and were waving small American flags. The flags that were otherwise posted were all at half-staff. For the last quarter mile up the hill, local Boy Scouts, spaced about 20 feet apart, all in uniform, held large flags. At the foot of the hill, I could look up and back and see how enormous the procession was. I wondered how many people would be at this funeral if it were in, say, Detroit or Los Angeles. Probably not as many as were here in Little Du Bois, Wyoming. The carriage stopped about 15 yards from the grave. Once the entire crowd was in place, the pallbearers came to attention and began to remove the casket from the caisson. As I had done all week, I came to attention and executed a slow ceremonial salute as Chance was being transferred from one mode of transport to another. From Dover to Philadelphia, Philadelphia to Minneapolis, Minneapolis to Billings, Billings to Riverton, and riveted to Du Bois, we had been together. Now as I watched them carry him the final 15 yards, I was choking up. I felt that as long as he was still moving, he was somehow still alive. Then they positioned him over his grave. He had stopped moving. Now he was home to stay. And I suddenly felt at once sad, relieved, and useless. It had been my honor to take Chance Phelps to his final post. Now he is on the high ground, overlooking his town. I miss him. Like that soldier, some American dead are buried in their hometowns. Others come here to Arlington National Cemetery to join the dead of America's other wars. The Iraq study group reported that American ground forces had been stretched almost to the breaking point. The surge President Bush has ordered to secure Baghdad is added to the strain with tours extended and time in the U.S. between deployments reduced. As the casualties in Iraq and Afghanistan have mounted, many have observed that in other wars, the American public was more directly involved to share the burden and the sacrifice. Unlike Vietnam, when the draft was still in force, the sacrifice in our current wars is borne almost entirely by our all-volunteer military services and their families. 
Tomorrow night, gangs of Iraq. In a special frontline report from Baghdad, Crossroads looks at American efforts to get Iraqi forces to fight their own sectarian violence. And what do those who were the strongest advocates of war in Iraq think now? We hear from one who remains convinced it was right, Richard Pearl. Tomorrow night, a special frontline America at a Crossroads presentation. Training an army or unknowingly training the militias. My greatest fear is that we're equipping Iraqis for civil war. And then... You are a weapon of mass destruction. Richard Pearl has been called the architect of the Iraq war. It is a war you cannot win. He continues to defend his ideas. We do not leave the battlefield with the first casualty. Coming tomorrow on America at a Crossroads. Find interactive maps, discussion guides, and more about America at a Crossroads at pbs.org. Funding for America at a Crossroads was provided by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. The Boeing Company is proud to support this broadcast of Operation Homecoming and the National Endowment for the Arts Operation Homecoming Initiative, bringing distinguished writers together with U.S. troops and their families to help share their wartime experiences. To order Operation Homecoming on DVD or the companion book, call 1-800-PLAY-PBS. Other programs from the America at a Crossroads series are also available.